Welcome to First Friday Forum. Uh, my name is Lynn Podian, and I am the facilitator um, for uh, our, our group, the Business Advocacy, and I am the chairperson. Um, I'd like to give you a few announcements so that you can finish eating. Um, there will be no First Friday Forum in July. That is our regular scheduled month off. We'll be back again in August with creative hiring practices. We'll be um, focusing with Dane Chekolinski um, from the CDC. In September, we'll have the um, DOT Secretary, Mike Gottlieb, here. Um, in October, we'll do Energy Focus. And we're going to be actually not at the Bull in October. So please don't come here. There's going to be a beautiful wedding getting set up. And we do not want to be a part of that. That would be very sad for the bride. She would not like to have another 50 people that she didn't expect. So we're going to actually be over at the Inn on Wood Lake. We're very happy to get to try out that new facility. So keep that in mind. That's October. Um, and then in um, June, we'd like to talk to you about our focal point that's coming up, June 18th. That's, oh gosh, that, that's in two weeks, isn't it? Two weeks? Yeah. Um, it's going to be the secret habits of successful entrepreneurs. Um, Jeff Liesmer? Lesmer. Good. I'm glad everybody else knows who I'm talking about. Um, Mary Pitch, Jim Craigle, and Caitlin Bratz are going to be with us that day. So today, though, we're here to talk or to listen to Dr. Rye, and he is here with Prevea. In 2000, Dr. Rye started at St. Mary's Hospital Medical Center, and he developed the organization's first hospitalist services. So you're going to have to. My question to you today is going to be, what is hospitalist in comparison to hospital? Okay, so I had to write it numerous times. So I need to know this. And then St. Mary's Medical uh, Director for Hospitalist Services and Physician Quality Director. Um, then he has been Prevea Health Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer. Um, today he is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Prevea Health, where he's the leader of 1,200 staff members and 300 plus primary and specialist providers. He's also the happy father of four beautiful children, three boys and a little girl. We let's welcome Dr. Rye. That wasn't too painful. No, thank you. She just said to me that wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs> All right, so I'll define a hospitalist for you. Uh, it's those board certified in internal medicine uh, that spend their entire life taking care of uh, sick, in sick individuals within the hospital in the intensive care unit. Um, so it's kind of humorous that I now run a clinic but never worked in one. I've always worked inside the hospital walls, but uh, uh, many of my partners uh, and I have uh, done that, and we actually have a program here at St. Nicholas as well. Um, thank you all for having me today. Uh, when Betsy asked me to speak about trends in healthcare in 2014, I promised myself I wouldn't just make it about the ACA or the government, but I would give a brief update, but I really want to talk to everybody about what's going on in healthcare, not only this year, but what we see as an organization, and, and more importantly, what we see as a community coming in the next five years to the next decade uh, regarding healthcare. And I tried to make this uh, relate, to, since you're all within business, uh, directly to those in business. Sorry, they got a mic in one hand, a remote in the other, and notes in front of me, so I hope not to fumble this too much. So, you know, the three categories I wanted to talk about today, and I uh, would love to have questions either during my uh, talk or after. Uh, I'm fine with both. Uh, but one is to update everybody on payment reform. What's going on right now um, post-implementation of most of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, what I mean most is there's certain other things that are going to happen throughout the year, but most of it. Um, and then a focus on health and wellness. Uh, what is going on in that category uh, within the country and what do we see coming forward? And then uh, a term that's more popular every day in healthcare, big data, and talk a little bit about uh, what are we doing with all of that data? So starting off with, uh, with health care reform, um, uh, I like this uh, little graphic here, um, but it's unfortunately not a game to us anymore. Uh, it's real. And uh, so now we can talk a little bit about health care reform and its specific effects on the state. You know, prior to this year, uh, there were some conceptual things that were being rolled out, but obviously it, it wasn't real until people started going on the exchange. Um, if we looked at our ACA enrollment uh, within the state of Wisconsin this year, uh, about 140,000 individuals uh, purchased a plan uh, on the exchange. And actually, I got to correct my language on that. 140,000 people enrolled uh, on that. Paid? We're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> 
Um, and a novel concept for those that have, and, and you gotta understand most of these individuals haven't had to purchase health insurance in the past. So they paid their first bill, not knowing that the amount they agreed to was monthly. Um, so we're starting to run into, what do you mean I have a second bill? So we're running into the, how many people are actually enrolled versus paying their premiums. Looking at the breakdown, about 55% female, 45% male. Uh, those needing a subsidy, about 91%. And those that you know, could pay for it fully on their own, about 9%. For those of you uh, that have not been on the exchange, the health plans are graded by a metal tier uh, and then a catastrophic plan. Platinum being a very expensive one, uh, even with a subsidy, hard to afford. Uh, it's only about 1% of what we saw in Wisconsin was platinum, about 6% gold. This is where you're gonna see those individuals who didn't need a subsidy once again, kind of their price point wanting a larger plan. Uh, the majority of those receiving a subsidy uh, were in the, uh, the silver range. And then once again in the bronze range, those that either received a subsidy and couldn't afford uh, the small amount of premium or those that just wanted something out there from a coverage standpoint. So what's our age demographic in the state of Wisconsin, those that have actually purchased uh, health insurance this year off the exchange? You'll see the, the sweet spot for the state of Wisconsin actually was in the 55 to 64 range and 45 to 54. That's slightly above the national average. So we had an older population uh, going to the exchange. Why does that matter? Um, really what makes the exchange work and what makes all of this purchasing work is you need a balance between those who are gonna need healthcare and those who are not gonna need healthcare. And logically, as we get older, we need more and more healthcare. So you need a strong young base purchasing to make the overall finances work. And we didn't see that in the state of Wisconsin. And that is probably nationwide, everybody's biggest concern right now, is the affordability of the payment reform really depends on a bunch of young, healthy people who don't ride motorcycles, drive the speed limit, never drink, have never looked at uh, a cigarette in their life enrolling, which would be what, maybe about two people in Sheboygan in Brown County? <laughs> Having grown up around here, we, we all know. Um, you know, this year we also had a couple curveballs thrown at us. And, and what am I mean by we? I'm not only talking to you as a healthcare provider and somebody who runs a healthcare organization and an insurance company, but I'm also talking as an employer. Uh, actually, uh, we're up to 1,600 employees now and 1,700 by the end of this, uh, end of this summer. So this matters to us in, in a variety of ways. So when um, Washington decided at the last minute to, you can keep your coverage, um, we were caught in a trap. All the insurance companies were ready to implement something and then had to figure out how to rewind. Um, it allowed people not to impact some of the uh, ACA provisions onto those that are purchasing, some were. It got very confusing uh, for individuals, but more importantly, very confusing for those in small group and large groups. Do we change health plans now? What, what is gonna be the effect on us? I know we have a couple insurance brokers in the room too, and. They could tell you, you know, everybody's heads were spinning right at the end there trying to figure out, so what do we do with everybody? And uh, it has been a confusing year from that perspective. So what are the things that are gonna happen uh, really as a result of ACA? You know, this isn't meant to be a, an anti-Affordable Care Act talk in any way. To be honest with you, as a healthcare provider, I can see positives and negatives coming from, from Washington through this. Probably one of the biggest uh, positives as a healthcare provider and somebody who cares about the health of the community is we've seen about a two to five uh, time increase in the emphasis on wellness initiatives and incentives within companies. Something that as a healthcare provider we've been trying to drive for a long time uh, with companies and many of you know that uh, here in town, uh, but it's been very difficult to get traction. A little easier to get traction now uh, as people are starting to understand the, the true cost of healthcare. Um, we're starting to see uh, increasing or considering increasing uh, emphasis on high deductible health plans. Um, it's interesting, and, I, and Andy Bagnell's in the room here from St. Nicholas, both Andy and I, if we were to call up our, uh, our controllers right now and ask them, you know, what's going on with bad debt? You know, uh, people not paying. A larger portion every year of our bad debt are people who actually have health insurance. 
In the past, most of our bad debt were people who did not have health insurance, could not afford, and we wrote it off. The majority of the biggest class of increasing in bad debt, almost 50% for us, are those who have health insurance because they can't afford the high deductibles. And we're talking about deductibles not of 500 or 1,000. 2,500 and 5,000 is very common in Green Bay. 2,500 pretty common around here for a family. And we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and companies, what are they thinking right now? Uh, in a recent survey, about 69% thought they had an okay understanding of the ACA, but not excellent, and they need more education. I must tell you, for somebody who practices medicine, and once again in my role, I need education every day. Um, more importantly, uh, I'll spend next week in D.C. on the Hill, and it's fun to ask them if they know what uh, some of the rules are. I get to play a little game on, on the Hill. They don't score very well, I'll be very honest with you. If I asked any one of our elected officials uh, to quote me some of the stats I was about to quote you or some of the information, um, they wouldn't know it. So what else are we seeing? You know, statistically, some of the research is showing us um, not many people, there was a big fear that people would start to lay off their employees because of the cost of health care. We have not seen that effect of ACA this year, thankfully. What we have seen, though, about 16% of uh, employers, mainly uh, what you look in the categories of the food industry and the service industry, cut the hours of employees. This is that 28-hour rule or 32-hour rule, um, basically trying to get them under full time. Uh, and make them part-time status so they don't have to get uh, purchase them health insurance in the future. Um, some of the employers have done this for effect, uh, to make a political point, and for some it's real. Um, but whatever the reason behind it, we are seeing it happen at about 16% um, per the stats that we get. Um, about two-thirds of employers have actually analyzed the, the impact on them, and the majority of employers see about a 3 to 4% cost hit right now. Uh, at least this year from, from the ACA. What are people doing out there when, when surveyed about this? Uh, about 43% are increasing the premium costs uh, or increasing in-network deductibles or out-of-pocket limits. These are what we're seeing in plan design changes across the country right now, both on the employer side and on the insurer side. So I knew I'd fumble at some point. Um, you know, this is, this is really important, especially in Sheboygan County and Brown County, the two major counties that, that Purvey is located in, that 94% of employers are, say, are saying that they will continue to provide health insurance. And probably the biggest reason is, and I know we've, uh, many of us work in, or work with manufacturing in this room, is the shortage of skilled labor. And it's still one of the biggest ways to attract and retain a labor force is by providing the benefit. So we're still seeing that for now. And, uh, and that may change. Um, for those that are going to discontinue, there's still two-thirds are saying that I'll still give you some sort of subsidy, but it'll have a cap. So this year it's 12000 and it will never increase, and that's all you'll get. Um, the issues with subsidies is the taxation around them. There are some ways to, to not, quote, get around that, but to, to have plan, plan signs so the subsidy's not taxed. But in other cases, employers are just saying, here's an increase in your salary, and it will be taxed. So today, none of us are taxed. If those of us who have provider-sponsored health care, we don't pay taxes on that. You can imagine getting that subsidy. You're only getting about a third to a half of your value right there. And really right now, when we, when we talk to employers and, and research this, they think that the requirement is what's going to increase their cost. So their, their requirement that they have to offer to full-time is an increased cost. And that's their biggest fear right now. So what about some of the costs that are going to now be coming in 2014 and 2015? There is what's called the risk adjustment program. Uh, so beginning this year, so unfortunate trend in health care, there'll be a dollar per member per year uh, that you sponsor for individuals and small, in, in small group plans. So this is an increase in the premium of what people are paying. And it's really, um, I don't want to call it a hidden tax, but it's a fee uh, meant to somewhat equalize that healthy to unhealthy amount that people are paying. So to put more in to take care of the sicker that are now joining. Um, and then a traditional reinsurance program that's always been used to offset the cost of high cost individuals on the exchange. Uh, there'll be um, some benefits that'll go away. 
So for those who have health plans on the exchange, this is our, for lack of better words, backup insurance to participate on the exchange. And as that subsidy goes away from the government, that cost increase will go down to the consumer. So right now, you're, if you have a health insurance plan, you may be getting a subsidy of $5. Next year, if it's $3, that $2 will then be passed on to the consumer. So you will see a guaranteed increase in cost over the next few years driven by the legislation. And then there's this uh, interesting, uh, I've yet to see the research out of, uh, and, uh, and we'll be curious to see what it shows, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute fee. Um, I think there's one person in Washington that just comes up with names uh, and, and abbreviations. So the, the PCORI, the PCORI, uh, is basically a um, dollar per month uh, tax out there, or fee. Um, that money is going into research uh, to see if what we're doing is actually the right thing to do or not, uh, for lack of better words, uh, to see what programs designs are actually going to work or not. So that's what PCRI is working on, is researching some of the health and wellness initiatives, seeing if actually paying for health insurance gets us a healthier America, those types of things. So a little bit more on cost. So starting in 2014, a lot, of, a lot of interesting trends in 14. If you asked me to give this talk in 13, this would have been a much more boring talk, Betsy. Actually, it's probably as boring right now because all my news talk numbers. But, uh, but starting in 14, another fee is coming our way. And this is actually uh, a fee on health insurance carriers. Um, depending on the size of your, uh, your book of business, um, this is how much the government needs to collect from you. What they're going to collect in fees is not tax deductible. Um, so the unfortunate part is, is that whatever fee or whatever the amount of premium they sell, they are going to have to increase that cost to make up to pay for this fee. So as you can see, the government expe expects about $14.3 billion from the health insurers throughout the country. Well, Wall Street expects the exact same margin out of those health insurers. So the only, one, only way to make them whole is to pass that cost on to the consumers and to the employers that are purchasing the health care. So you see an increasing guaranteed cost here uh, that's, that's essentially legislated over the next five years. All right, that's enough about the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, at least the negative part of it. Now, like I mentioned, probably the best thing that came out of the Affordable Care Act, from my perspective, is an awareness in this country that we need to get healthier. The only way you make all those numbers really disappear is to have a healthier America. And how do you do that? You don't do that by providing health insurance. Uh, you, all you're doing by providing health insurance is a payment, but you haven't really taken care of the underlying fact of how we actually seek health care and what we're seeking health care for. Many Americans still, if we were to go around our companies today, wouldn't be able to identify a primary care physician or what they've done for their health and wellness but they'll tell you who their doctor is when they get sick. And that's not the mentality we need. And the cool part about what happens out of ACA is we're starting to see employers engage us in the healthcare industry to make populations healthier. So first of all, what we're seeing now is participation in wellness programming that informs and educates. You know, as, as an organization, we truly believe everything starts with education um, and really educating the workforce, those that are getting the insurance, um, so we've got lunch and learns, and we, uh, more and more people are asking us to do on-site fitness and on-site nutrition counseling. Um, who here has vending machines in their organization or where they work? A few of you. How healthy are those vending machines? No. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. Believe it or not, companies now bring us in to give them healthy vending machines. And we, we actually have that in our own buildings now. Uh, and in the past where companies refused to do that because they're worried about the HR office receiving complaints, now we're starting to see companies make bolder and bolder moves and allowing us to actually put healthy food and take the soda out of the vending machines. I hope nobody here is from Coke or Pepsi. <laughs> I always get myself in trouble. I have a good habit of doing that. The other thing is, is that we're starting to see companies now do something with their data too. Many companies for many years offered health risk assessments to their employees. Um, it's kind of humorous. When I started going around and meeting with employers about six years ago, um, every HR director would pull out a file 
and put on the table a stack of their health risk assessment results. But they couldn't actually tell me what actual activities they did to address the specific things they found outside of some did smoking cessation. Now we see more and more employers really engaging on doing something with that data. On-site fitness classes, um, medical programming, we call it a healthier you program, but many other companies have different names for it, where we find out 30 or 40 individuals in a company may have um, a risk factor uh, for developing diabetes called the metabolic syndrome, and specifically programming around that. So we're seeing companies really engaging around that these days. Obviously, smoking sensation. We're also seeing people actually bringing uh, us in to help with sleep, uh, a big component of staying healthy. And, uh, and well-being, you know, managing chronic diseases in the workplace. It's such a nice captive audience there. And you can educate them. You're paying for their health insurance as an employer. And we're starting to see more and more engagement throughout the country on that, definitely in our local areas. We're also seeing people doing more because the whole concept of addressing a pre-existing condition is gone. So one of the fears or barriers to actually even looking for what's wrong in a company is identifying some sort of pre-existing condition. There was a fear factor in America of even seeking health care. Um, that's gone now. So we're seeing a lot more engagement in the long term because insurances can't hold that against you. So definitely seeing that. And we're also seeing a lot more incentives with employers. They want to put skin in the game. And we've been begging employers for a long time to help us with this, to put skin in the game. You're paying for their health insurance. Why don't you motivate people to get healthy, but also reward them, either with lower premiums, monetary rewards, free offerings, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the Pebble in a little bit. You know, attend a class, pay less. And it's really, it's really creating traction. Also, fun things we're seeing, we're also seeing, and I guess I'm on a podcast right now, so I can say this, uh, we're starting to see, you know, video podcasts being distributed in organizations, um, so it's easier to get health and wellness education across. That's a, a much bigger uh, trend for us in 2014, and we're starting to see those that are um, much more active about health coaching on site. That's a big deal. Um, for the longest time, people did their health risk assessments, and then who here would get a phone call? from somebody trying to coach them over the phone uh, to get them healthier. We saw that that wasn't the best way to uh, do things, but live coaching, we've seen positive results, and in, in the research is showing us across the board uh, that if you get a health coach in there, you can make a, about 70% of the time we can make a change uh, versus when there's not a health coach there. So that's what we're seeing in health and wellness around the country, and obviously can answer a lot of questions about that. This is actually probably one of my most favorite topics, and it's data, because I'm a geek. Uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, and, and we've been aggregating data now for over a decade. Our medical record is EPIC, um, based in Verona, Wisconsin, used across the country. More than half the country has their medical record on EPIC, as far as uh, citizens. And now in Sheboygan County, both hospitals are on EPIC as well. So we're starting to see a coordination of care. But the cool thing, having made this decision back in 2002, is that we have 10 years of ones and zeros. And now we can actually do something with it. So we've partnered with a couple IT companies. One is named up there, really looking at all the data we have. What are patients missing in their health care? And uh, worked with the company a lot to start making our data actionable. Because in the past, it's ones and zeros, locked away on a server, to be honest with you, if we did nothing with it, we spent $50 million on a, on a really expensive version of Microsoft Word. We really needed to do something with the data that we were collecting. You can see here, I've given uh, uh, John Doe screenshots for you today. Uh, um, but, so this is all protected information. But on any typical patient within our organization, we can bring up a page like this up that has a chronic disease, see what their current rates are, so those are lab tests, LDLs for, for anybody who's ever had their cholesterol checked. We can see where our goal is. We can see where a patient's trends are. Um, obviously, look at alerts and recommendations. So in the past, you know, what reminded us what the patient was missing? It really was our own head and going through a checklist. Now everything is automated. So a physician doesn't always need to do this. 
a staff member can pull up this page, see what the patient is missing, make sure all that is done before the patient even sees the physician. So we're much more efficient using data. We can look at the medications, and we can also see the last time we communicated with that patient and how we did it, phone, email, in person, because guess what? Healthcare is no longer going to be regulated to just the physician's office. Once again, a couple other screenshots here of what we do every day with the patient management. This is uh, one person's work list uh, within the organization for their physician, pulling up all their patients, what conditions they have, who their insurance is, and their alerts and recommendations. Why do we have the insurance settled out? Because we can pull up insurance and now, by the end of the summer, by employer. So if company X asked us, what are you doing for our diabetics today, or what can we do for our diabetics today? We can literally narrow that down. This takes us about 90 seconds on a computer to do. We also can benchmark our physicians against each other. And this isn't, a, this isn't to say you're bad and you're good, but uh, you've all heard the medical school jokes of how many pre-med students does it take to change a light bulb to, one to screw it in, one to pull the ladder out from underneath them. We're inherently a competitive breed. Uh, and, and you start unblinding data within an organization and showing physicians where they're at, uh, they get really good about learning who's doing it great and then taking that into their own office. And we've seen that across our organization. So we give them these benchmarks and then they help us learn what are the best practices and then we spread them. This is kind of a unique thing. I can, once again, go on my laptop and do this, where every doctor can see their patient population in a discrete way like this about where they're leaning towards healthy or sick. And if they hovered above any one of those dots, the patient name shows up. So who's my worst patient? And literally can ho hover over that. And usually they'll have their medical assistant call that patient right away and say, you need to get in. And once again, care opportunities. This is how we can literally send out automated campaigns. So this is new for 2014. Um, we were one of the first companies uh, in, in the United States to pilot this. A lot of what you're seeing on the screen here was actually designed in Green Bay. Uh, the company's based in Dallas, but they, uh, they embedded their employees up by us, so we told them what we needed, and they designed a product for us. Um, this is basically saying, what if I want to take everybody on Humana? Uh, and what are they missing, um, and I really want to focus on blood pressure today, and send out an automated campaign. So in about two minutes, they can get that, and then they can hit a button where they'd either each get a phone call or an email or some sort of reminder that we need to see them for this reason. And uh, the automated campaigns are going very well and engaging a patient population that maybe was, you know, not wanting to come see us. So... That's the data we have on the sick or that who need us. But what about the health and wellness data? This is a whole new area for us this summer uh, to focus on is the health and wellness data. So we've been telling employers, please incentivize your employees to get involved. Please do this. Please do that. HR departments probably want to kill me because they have to manually try to figure out what their employees are doing, record that, and then send that to the insurance company about the premium or the HR department. We're now partnering to automate all of that. So you can see screenshots here. Uh, this will be introduced. In, it's actually coming to this market here this next month, and it's actually being introduced at Purveya. We actually have a full FTE, and all she does is record 1,600 employees' wellness activities. That FTE now, she'll find a job, don't worry. Uh, but we've automated everything for that person now. So as different employees participate in different areas of their health and wellness, it, they self-report, but the company will then adjudicate that or make sure that actually happened. Um, and in some cases, say it's an activity thing where they're wearing a pebble, which is a tiny little pedometer. All they have to do is walk by a computer. They don't have to enter anything, and it's automatically recording their, their activity, and they're automatically getting the points for their benefits um, recorded. This has made it much easier for HR departments. Uh, to track. This is an example of how an employee would enter in. Um, but say an employer had 2,000 employees and they would give a $50 discount to everybody that had an HRA. We just take that HRA data, feed it directly into here, and the employer already knows who did it and um, who actually acted upon it. And once again, examples of the scorecard. And more importantly for the employer, the sheets they get on everything their employees have done. 
So no longer is it somebody in HR having to manually track this or have an Excel spreadsheet. So what are the biggest trends we're seeing right now uh, across the board? You know, really the healthcare company in the past, as, you, as I've talked here, we've really in the past focused on what can we do to you today? How many here have seen a commercial about a robot or what we can do to your eyes or what we can do to your heart? That really is what we were paid to do. We were profits were driven by volume and illness. I mentioned I'm a hospitalist. Um, I actually went into administration not because I got sick of being a hospitalist. I love it and I still practice. It's because I got to see every day the failures in medicine. And to me, a patient in the hospital is a failure of, of what we could have done to prevent that. So it gave me an opportunity in this role to do something about all the failures I saw. So many of the patients I saw, or so many of the patients I pronounced dead, to be honest with you, could have been prevented if things had been done 10, 15, 20 years ahead of time. And we had perverse incentives. Think about it. We don't get, we get paid the most, the sicker you get. You know, open heart surgery is great, but guess what? After open heart surgery, if you're not breathing well and we have to put a tracheotomy in you, we make an extra $10,000. That's how perverse medical incentives are, and they need to change. That's the reality of it. And I'm here to say I don't really appreciate that reality. So the healthcare system of the future, so you had companies of the past, and now it takes an entire system uh, to care for a patient. You've got to focus on keeping a population healthy. Profits are driven in a risk or a gain-sharing model. In other words, if the physicians and the hospitals don't have risk or skin in the game, they'll never change their incentives. We did ours by having our own insurance company. Nothing riskier in the world than doing that, let me tell you. Um, and then technology focused on keeping people healthy. So the biggest advancements in technology when I was in training were really around stents and what we can put in you and robots and what we could do to you. And now the biggest technology trends we're seeing across the country are ways we can keep you healthy. And we need to focus on that as well. And maximizing access to information and expertise without needing to come to the office. And, and this is not Star Trek. This is not something that doesn't exist this year. This is actually something that does exist this year, and that's the virtual visits. And you'll see this coming out more and more. Uh, we'll be rolling this out to all of our employer customers here this year, where if we have an employer clinic within you and it's 10 o'clock at night and we're not open, you can pick up your iPhone, you can FaceTime, you can Skype, it's all legal. It'll actually be embedded in an electronic medical record, and you can create and get care. So Betsy said you wanted to see your doctor from your office. You can now see your doctor from your office. What does this do? Well, we have a physician shortage throughout the, Oregon, throughout the United States in certain specialties. Psychiatric care is a great example of a, a shortage across the country. Well, psychiatrists generally, or probably shouldn't, be touching the patient. Um, and so they can do so much more on video. So we'll have telepsych starting for us in September, uh, and then virtual urgent care visits hopefully before the end of 2014. So you'll see more and more of this happening with a physician shortage and a patient population that wants to interact with us this way. I think it's more important that we're responding to the patients and the consumers' needs now. This is how they want to stay healthy. We need to adapt. So no more building big hospitals, smaller clinics, more efficient clinics, and a lot more technologies, which you're going to see starting in 14 going on. There was a time where I never thought I would buy into this. Now I think this is the way we need to go. One of the biggest fears people have is we'll overprescribe. And actually the data shows that the antibiotic prescription rate in a virtual visit is about a third than if you have to see the patient because you're not getting guilted by mom right in the room. <clears throat> and we're seeing that across the country. So this may actually be a better way to provide acute care as well and a great way to provide education. So that's what I ha have about what's going on in 2014 for us in healthcare. I'd be happy to answer questions or, or take comments. On the uh, issue of medications, what about if, if this is going to happen, how will there be checks so that somebody that doesn't go to college can get their medication and they're not having to go to the hospital? Yeah, so there'll be certain things such as narcotic prescriptions, Schedule 3, Schedule 2s, that will be restricted from this. Um, the state of Wisconsin is a little bit more forward thinking in this category where we have uh, the control substance uh, agreement between pharmacies so we actually can find out who's doctor hopping. Um, I know if you've read some of the uh, Sheboygan Press articles in the Green Bay Press Gazette as well, 
on the an increasing use in heroin. Uh, the, the starter drug for all of that is, is narcotics. And then when they can't get access to narcotics, they go to a cheaper version, which is heroin. Um, we actually are trying to lead the way in, in the prevention of this. Um, but Wisconsin actually has more fail-safes than this. And we won't be doing pain medication from this or scheduled substances. Actually, it would be the first clinic in the state of Wisconsin that we've been told that will require mandatory drug testing for anybody on a chronic uh, narcotic. So if you want to refill, you've got to get drug tested to prove that you're actually taking the drug. Well, you would hope that integrated records were that good. If you stay in a coordinated system, uh, yes. But there are other medical records in the state of Wisconsin, so you can hop. And, um, you know, I worked ER to pay my way through uh, to, to get my first down payment on my house in Green Bay. So, and I worked in a very small town ER. And I think I've seen every excuse and every trick in the book. Uh, and, and there's ways, to, you know, those who are seeking illicit drugs have a way to get, a way to get them. Yes. We had the data for the last 10 years for this area. Uh -huh. and you said you were able to you know, analyze that. Any trends that you're seeing, positive or negative, for Northeast Wisconsin? For Northeast Wisconsin, probably our biggest concern as an organization and, and what we're addressing is the area of pediatric obesity. Um, we actually have a medical home dedicated and a, an entire project and a strategic plan initiative to combat pediatric obesity. Um, and and we, we want to have a focus on this. It, it makes sense. Like I said, so much of what I saw in the hospital could have been prevented 20 and 30 years in, before. So by the time I'm getting a 35-year-old, sometimes it's too late. Sometimes the damage has been done. Um, it was very, very shocking when we pulled our data. It was depressing. You know, we were, we were scrolling through on the screen, and I couldn't believe I was seeing 400-pound 12-year-olds uh, on the screen. And um, so we definitely are focused on that. The other trend we're seeing is uh, there's an interesting form of noncompliance. And noncompliance to me is not just not seeing or not taking your medication or listening to your doctor, but many people with chronic disease aren't having scheduled visits. They're not interacting with the healthcare team, whether it be a physician or somebody else, in a regular manner. And that's why we redesigned our care around chronic disease. We have this thing our statement at Prevea is that the visit never ends. So depending on the severity of your disease depends on how often we're going to touch you, whether it be a physician or a nurse call or an automated call. All of that is actually tiered depending on the severity of your illness now. Yes, John. It, it would seem to me that we're going to have to have a, a really cataclysmic media shift with what gets advertised watch weekend sports, it's beer, soda pop, things like that, Viagra, water. If you watch the evening news, it's one medication after another. And I think that's the way most people pick up their news, pick up their information. So to me, it, it, it seems like there's going to have to be a really big change in how people get information, how, and even pushing it down to the younger ages. Yep. understand the long-term benefits or deficiencies of how you're living. You know, the hard part there is that there's so much money, yeah. uh, and you have to have guts. Um, for those of you uh, who saw our Game Changer program, we took six individuals, three from Sheboygan County, three from Brown County, and focused on making them healthier. So think about spending seven figures as an organization to make sure you don't make any money. You think about that entire marketing campaign was focused on us not making any money. Because you remember our perverse incentives, how we get paid. You have to go out there and put your neck on the line to change it. Now, we make enough money that we can do that. But if we don't start focusing on the health and wellness of the community, I'm not going to have anybody left to work for us. I mean, it is, it's that bad. Um, but the only way you can combat that, you can't sit here and regulate and legislate against somebody's voice. We're, we're proud that you can't do that in this country. But then you have to have bold enough voices to market over that. Yes? You know on that scatter graph, um, you said when you were further out, it, is 
Yeah. Is it the goal to try and get everybody to the Into it, no, into uh, the green quadrant there. There's, a, it, there's different quadrants. Uh, depending on the disease process, I mean, you can actually check, you can change your X and Y axis on that. Right. In that slide, we want to get to a better quadrant there. Yes, in the back. Doctor, I appreciate the information and specifically the attention that you gave to the increased interest in wellness programs. If I could, maybe just highlight that the legislature has kind of understood that and recognized mm -hmm. it as well. And so in the current session, the legislature and the governor created a wellness tax credit for, for businesses that will kick in 2015, and it helps to cover the cost of starting wellness programs here in the state of Wisconsin. It's for smaller employers, I think 50, 15 and fewer. Yep. And then it can cover a big chunk of your wellness startup costs. And we are extremely grateful uh, to Madison for that. Um, we fought a lot for that. We're kind of hoping it would be more than 50 employees, but we understand that. Um, but it's, it's fantastic. Uh, we have, uh, for example, I can give you a company that uh, we work with every week on on-site fitness that uh, has less than 50 FTEs at that site. Um, and they've had us on site now four or five years, and that's Suruji's Chocolate. I uh, guess they had a thing about eating their product. Uh, and, uh, but think about a chocolate company taking the leadership and investing money on on-site fitness. They did it out of their own pockets, but now thanks to Madison and, and, and a really a very important piece of legislation, probably one of the most important that I, you know, from a healthcare provider standpoint, it was the first health care piece of legislation. It wasn't sick care. It was a health care piece of legislation that was put forward. We wish it would go national, and hopefully we can set an example by showing some data trends. Um, those of us that are involved in that, um, we want to track the health now that they get. The employers are going to take advantage of that tax credit, track the health of those employees, and, and try to publish that so we can make that um, a more prominent piece of legislation. So thanks for mentioning that. So I think it was a three-year three -year. program, and yep. I think the hope would be that it is, is successful and it can be actually promoted and right. enhanced. I, I'll share that the legislature has begun to look at tax credits because we oftentimes create tax credits and then there's very little use of them, and it costs us a lot of money actually as a state to just kind of have these programs out there. So if your business is interested, please participate, and that will then help to grow the support for the program. Well, our two health and wellness salespeople are sitting there. They know about the tax credit, and they'll be reminding every single employer at 15 under. The reason it is a three-year pilot, because I would agree with Madison, make sure it works before you pay for it forever. So our point is, is that we're going to track that data to prove that it works. Andy, you want to plug yours for me? Yeah. <laughs> Andy and I are good friends. Yeah, no, no, and we, and we are colleagues. We're partners, as most of you know. Purvey is a 50-50 company. Um, and really, if you look at all of the trends, acute care hospitals aren't going to become the center of health care anymore. They just aren't. But they are extreme cost burden uh, on, on society, and they're major employers. So there's always this balancing act. You don't want the hospitals to go away because they're usually the largest employer in town. But at the same time, it's where we're spending all our money that we don't need to. We're trying to find unique ways of redesigning hospitals. So they're really there to be large intensive care units for the really, really sick and those that are giving birth and those for emergent care. But then more ambulatory solutions, more clinic-based solutions for the rest. You're now seeing, for the, uh, who here has known somebody who's had a hip replacement? You know, hip replacements used to spend 3.4 days, 3.2 days in a hospital by statistics and then go off to a rehab facility. You're starting to see many surgeons now, and there's two in Northeast Wisconsin, one is ours, that are piloting same day to rehab, right out of surgery. No hospital stay for a hip replacement. So there, yeah, it's two days now for, for most of ours in, at St. Nick's and at, at St. Mary's and St. Vincent's where we do the most of our hips. But um, one of our guys is piloting right to rehab. Now it takes the right patient for that, the right elective patient, but we're starting to see us getting bolder and bolder about what needs to be out of the hospital. You know what, and the early results are showing those people are doing better, because guess what's in a hospital? Sick people. 
And usually you're getting hip replacement, you just got pain, you don't, you're not sick, you don't want to be around sick people. So actually we're starting to see more and more thinking around that. And, and actually St. Nicholas has done those investments in an ambulatory surgical center, moving things into more of an ambulatory environment. I'd say between Andy and I, there's a lot more growth going on the outpatient side than there is an inpatient side, almost two to one right now. Uh, and our, our business now has shifted. We're about 65% outpatient based now. Yeah. Significant shift. And what rate of time is that? Yeah. We were probably 50 four or five years ago. Yeah. And that's a big shift. Um, now, the hard thing is with all of us moving to an ambulatory environment, how are you going to continue to pay for those really big buildings and the infrastructure? Um, that's going to be a challenge for some systems that have built a lot. And, uh, and that's cross country. And we're seeing that. That's why you're seeing a lot of consolidation uh, in, in healthcare. Some of that's needed. Some of that, I think we got to wait five years to see what the, the what's going to happen. Just yes. Uh, one question, more personally, with the electronic medical data. Yes. Is that information now accessible to the patient? Yes. Okay, that's a so great I'm question. I love that question. So. I can look at what my blood pressure was last time. Yeah, actually, if I can pull my iPhone out for you right now, I can pull up my own medical record for you. Uh, we have our, our app, uh, the, My, the MyPurveya app, and you can make an appointment, you can do your refills, you can check your blood pressure, you can see your last visit, and more importantly, if you're in a car accident someplace and the person that's with you says they're from Green Bay, we can now look at Epic Records across the country and pull what we need to to take care of you that day. We do it every day. Yep. Uh, you know, if a patient from St. Nick's gets transferred to us, it's, it's actually the same record. Uh, so say somebody comes in with chest pain, needs open heart surgery emergently, gets transferred there. We have everything before the patient even arrives. We have it within probably less than 10 clicks. Someone on vacation from the other side of the country happens to be in Sheboygan, gets sick. Hospital or, or physicians on Epic have access in less than a minute. Yeah, you know, for example, we'll have, we are the, actually I can officially announce this, I guess we're signing the contract, we're the healthcare provider for the 2015 PGA. Uh, so we'll have tens of thousands of people from around the country, but we'll have Epic on site in case they happen to have a medical record there, we can pull it up. So it's providing better care. Well, thank you everybody for having me. Love coming to these lunches and uh, happy to stick around for any other questions. Um, we'd like to thank you because um, this has been a very in inspirational conversation and we appreciate you coming. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, don't forget, next week is the focal point on June 18th. We have flyers at the door that John will be making sure you take home with you. Give them to your friends, your neighbors, your family. Just kidding. Um, also, um, we still would like to have some of you join us for the business advocacy team. So our meeting is next Friday morning at the chamber. Um, we start at 7.30, and you're all invited to come and see what that is like to be a part of the group that actually um, develops these meetings and puts this out for you. So thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a lovely afternoon and a beautiful weekend.